Thank you to Skillshare for sponsoring today's video. At Yovi's Home, we are always trying to learn new things. That's why we love Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of inspiring classes for creators. You can explore new skills, deepen existing passions, and get lost in creativity. With classes like Explaining the Criminal Mind in 60 Minutes or Forensic Criminal Psychology, there is undoubtedly something for every true crime lover. The YouTube success Script, Shoot, and Edit with MKBHD class really helped us with creating this new series. Skillshare is curated specifically for learning, meaning there are no ads and they're always launching new premium classes so you can stay focused and follow wherever your creativity takes you. And the best part is that it's less than $10 a month with an annual subscription. The first thousand of my subscribers to click the link in the description will get a free trial of the premium membership so you can explore your creativity. Thanks again to Skillshare. Now let's get to today's video. Hi, welcome to Yovi's Home and welcome to my series where we talk about a true crime that is somehow connected to the Netherlands. Now, I'm a true crime fanatic and I formerly worked in international criminal law, so I thought it would be really fun to share these stories of Dutch true crime with you too. Last time, I shared the story about the Heineken kidnapping, but today's story is a little bit darker and it is about poison and greed and the most prolific poisoner of all time. So why don't you come on in, put on your detective hat and stay a while. Let's solve some crimes together. The Dutch word of the day is vergiftige, and that means poison. Maria Katharina van der Linden Swannenberg was born on September 9th, 1839 in Leiden on the Leidste Auswarsgracht to Clemens and Johanna. Her father was a textile worker and her mother, she took care of the kids. Her father worked 12 hours a day, six days a week, but nevertheless, he just never earned enough money to support his family. And any money that he did earn, he spent it on drinking. So the family, they lived in like a really rundown home and like so many, you know, physical workers in those days, the family ate mainly potatoes. In combination with the heavy physical labor that everyone did at the time, this diet left, you know, the members of the family like chronically malnourished and sick. At this time, infant mortality was like a huge problem due to these circumstances. Maria's parents, they had 12 children, but only five reached adulthood. And as such, as soon as she was able to, Maria, she contributed to the family income by like knitting stockings or washing clothes or babysitting children. Like she was doing whatever she could to get some money. Now the misery like continued to haunt Maria when she started a family of her own. Perhaps the most traumatic was the loss of her first daughter, who she had named Katarina. She died of cholera during the epidemic of 1866 when she was just two years old. Now, the working class areas were much more affected by cholera at the time than like the good areas, and children in particular turned to be like the most vulnerable. There were streets in which there was a death in literally almost every house. Maria experienced no fewer than four cholera outbreaks during her lifetime. Now on May 13, 1868, Maria married Johannes van der Linden, who was a factory worker at the Grafs Mederai. Maria had already had three children before her marriage, but only one of them had survived. So her son was eventually adopted by her husband. And the couple, they went on to have seven children, uh, of whom only two survived. So if you're not keeping track, that's a total of three surviving children. In the space of 11 years, Maria had lost six of her nine kids, like at a very young age. Shortly after her last child died in 1877, Maria, she, she just started drinking. Now the family, they lived in the poorest neighborhoods in Leiden. Maria, she worked as a laundress, and she was known as the helpful neighbor who often looked after children and also the sick people. She even helped during funerals like at her friends houses and her neighbors and she would perform like different tasks that went alongside like you know funeral preparations. 
she was so well known as like a good natured and always helpful woman and she earned the nickname Huya Mi or Good Me. And this is the name that everyone knew her as. Now at this point in time, it was pretty common for people to purchase funeral insurance because while people were poor, they still valued having a proper burial. And because they could not afford a burial outright, buying insurance, it was just, it was the great way to ensure that, you know, you could have a nice funeral when you passed. Under the law at that time, it was possible to insure people like several times over, double, triple, four times the amount of the cost of a funeral. As long as the weekly premium was paid, it was no problem. It was also completely possible to insure people who were not related to you. You just give the name, you pay the premium, and bada bing, bada boom, you are now the proud owner of a funeral insurance policy on whoever you choose. Can you see where the story is going? Well, before we get ahead of ourselves. On December 8th, 1883, the Frankhausen family returned home from a day out. And after eating dinner, the entire family had become terribly ill. The mother, who was also named like Marie, and she happened to be Maria's sister. <laughs> so Marie and her newborn son, Hendrik, they died after a short but like super severe bout of illness. But the father, Hendrik Franz Frankhausen, he had subsequently gone to his doctor, Dr. van der Luff. Based on the symptoms that he was presenting with, Dr. van der Luff, he suspected poisoning. And as such, he immediately went on and he made a report to the police who began an investigation. The police, they started an investigation around the neighborhood to see like, you know, what's going on. They were asking questions. And it was reported that while the Frankhausens were out, they had left like a pot of porridge cooking over the fire, you know, so like it would be ready when they came home. I imagine that it was like an 1800s version of a crock pot or a slow cooker. <laughs> um, but this was completely normal at the time. There was, there was not, that was not weird, but this was reported by witnesses. Witnesses also reported that they had heard Maria enter the Frankhausen house on that day, which again, it's not so strange since she was related to the Frankhausens. Like she was, you know, Marie's sister and she often helped out with like various things around the house. Other witnesses still reported that they had noticed that Maria was often purchasing funeral insurance for various people like some of whom she was related to and others like she was not related to them. So you guys, while each of these facts on its own was not suspicious, the combination of all of them gave the investigators reasonable suspicion to, you know, interview Maria and also to search her home. When investigators showed up at Maria's house, they found not only the registration for funeral insurance for baby Frankhausen, but also for many, many more people. It was enough for the police to determine that she had both the opportunity and the motive to kill the Frankhausen family, and so they arrested her. But do you remember that Maria was like so helpful and so beloved by everyone in her neighborhood that she was known as Good Me? Yeah, well, like the neighbors did not believe that she was guilty and they just could not take that. They actually protested and shouted like obscenities at the police and for like even thinking that she could be the murderer. Well, they were wrong. Basically, Maria confessed to the crime within a few days, but literally no one was prepared for the bombshell that was about to come. As part of the investigation, professors Tunis Zahir and Edward Vandenberg of Leiden University, they were tasked with autopsying Marie and baby Frankhausen's bodies to like really determine their cause of death. Um, up to this point, it was just suspicion of poison. They removed and examined different organs in which you could expect like traces of poisoning. So like the intestines, the liver, the stomach, the kidneys, all of this. Through testing that was available at that time, they actually managed to determine the cause of death, arsenic poisoning. 
Now, arsenic is a very aggressive poison. People who ingest it, like they start to vomit terribly within minutes and they suffer from like diarrhea that can last for days on end. Many victims therefore either die of dehydration or just like from organ failure because their organs are so badly damaged. But the question is like where and how could Maria access the arsenic? Now, earlier I mentioned that Maria had worked as a laundress in Leiden and she was helping people with their laundry all the time. Well, at that time, if you had bed bugs, you most certainly did not just throw everything away the way that we would now. No, you would just like go ahead down to your neighborhood, like the router drugstore and get a little concoction that had some arsenic powder in it. And similarly, if you had a vermin problem, you could just buy a product, um, which was called like an operment from the drugstore. And it too was an arsenic powder that the chemist would like stir into like a bucket of whitewash or something. What I'm trying to say is that it was easy to get, you know? And as a part of this investigation, two undercover officers, they went to the shop and they were able to buy enough of the poison powder for 10 cents to kill 100 people. The preliminary investigation covered approximately 90 suspicious deaths. So between the opportunity, motive, and access to arsenic, plus her confession, investigators were like certain that they had their killer. But folks, you guys, this story, this story just not, it does not end here. It's bad enough, right? But like, it, it doesn't end here. This investigation and trial, coupled with Maria's stellar reputation, it created a media frenzy at the time. As more and more information came out, people in Maria's community, well, they started remembering, like, suspicious deaths, like, in their own family. And as such, they agreed to have their loved ones exhumed and autopsied as well. So a total of 16 people ended up being autopsied and 14 of them had trace amounts of arsenic in their organs. You wanna hear something super messed up? In connection with the investigation, the exhumed bodies like had to be identified by family members, but these family members oftentimes had also ingested the arsenic, but had survived. Basically, sometime between 1879 and 1881, Maria began systematically poisoning people. At first, she just poisoned individuals, but later on, she decided to, you know, go ahead and poison the entire family, including small children and babies. And do you remember those funeral insurance policies I mentioned before? Well, it seems that Maria like definitely had a financial incentive to kill like those victims. In total, she had earned like an estimated two to three thousand guilders <laughs> thanks to her murder practices, which this was like an enormous and obscene amount of money at that time. But not only was she getting paid out by the insurance policies, but like the families of the victims, they often also paid her to babysit during the funeral or to prepare the bodies and do that stuff. Like, so she was just like making money on top of money on top of money based like off her murdering. By the time she was caught though, it seemed that she had like actually lost control. Um, and she had started just killing random people without a financial motive. She had turned from committing murder out of desperation to like committing murder as a hobby, which is just fucked up. Prior to her trial on April 23rd, 1885, the judge wanted to know if Maria was like mentally sound. And so two doctors examined her. They concluded that her mind was very harsh and that the whole physical and psychic inquiry led them to declare that the accused was in full possession of her mental faculties. Therefore, no insanity defense was allowed at her trial. And because of the media frenzy surrounding the investigation, the courtroom was absolutely packed and her trial was called the trial of the century. Maria's own defense lawyer, Mr. Valiant, admitted that she had actually poisoned 65 people. Of that, 42 survived and 23 had died. 
Of the victims, 16 belonged to her own family. And her own lawyer ended up saying that he couldn't save Maria because the proof was just absolutely overwhelming. She never showed any signs of remorse for her crimes and she asked that the court only show her mercy for her punishment. On May 1st, 1885, she was found guilty of three poisonings and she received a life sentence. A direct result of Maria's crimes, several laws were changed in the Netherlands. So for example, it became more difficult to buy heavy poisons such as arsenic and it also became more difficult to take out insurance in the name of someone else. Professor Zaire, he also wrote a book in which he refuted the idea that arsenic poisoning would lead to mummification of the corpse, which up until then was the belief at the time. She spent the next 30 years in prison where she died in 1915. From her nickname of Huya Mi, it turns out that she would become the greatest serial killer in Dutch history. There you have it, you guys. This is the true story of Huya Mi. I really hope that you enjoyed this video. Let me know what you think and if you would like to see more. And if you want to see more, who should I cover next? Let me know in the comments below. Thank you so much for coming over today and solving this case with me. I really appreciate it and I look forward to seeing you in the next one. Doei!